The very last segment we've got here on Unit 7, uh, we're going to talk about personality. And we've talked about the various fields and theories that have uh, emerged coming up to roughly the 1980s or so. And that's where we're going to pick up with our final segment, uh, which is about, uh, it's tough to put a name to this, but it's basically focused on a lot more uh, genetic uh, physiological elements regarding uh, personality as well as behavior. <clears throat> so. Um, We'll, uh, we'll call it the biopsychological logical, um, uh, personality theories. <clears throat> All right, so uh, this is gonna again, some of the roots are earlier, but it's really gonna start picking up momentum in the 1980s and especially in the 1990s. In fact, you probably even say the 1990s is when it really started. In fact, that's what we'll say. Um, so just know the roots are certainly earlier, as you'll see. Uh, but the 1990s when this really begins to uh, gain a lot of momentum. So if you recall, past explanations for personality were based primarily on uh, non-genetic factors. Um, and again, that became very unpopular, genetic explanations for behavior uh, or ability. You know, as we've talked about multiple times, the eugenics movement and the, the Holocaust and all of that, after World War II, uh, but, or during and then after World War II, uh, but by the 70s and 80s, um, some of the theories that completely ignore um, genetic factors, or largely ignore it, um, are not consistent enough to explain all of the uh, psychological uh, phenomena, or whether it's intelligence or it's personality, those are the two biggest ones. Uh, as far as its impact on, on behavior and ability, uh, those don't line up with the purely unconscious related with the psychoanalysts uh, or the purely um, humanistic or behavioralist ex explanations with which either you know explain it as reaction to an external stimuli stimuli and, and consequences uh, or as the humanist is like this this amalgam of, of free will uh, or even the uh, socio cognitive explanations which uh, look at individual situations as that is a, a, the primary determinant of uh, personality and behavior. Uh, and certainly, the socio-cognitive uh, explanations were much closer uh, to accurate, but uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, they don't fully explain why people behave the way they behave, even in certain scenarios or in response to certain stimuli. So definitely acknowledge the influence of, uh, of mental processes and, and trait characteristics like uh, you know, their temperament or their likes or dislikes or whatever. <clears throat> but then it also equally valued the environment and the uh, uh, external stimuli and our, our experience with that. Um, those two factors are also going to be largely dependent upon um, your uh, genetic uh, temperament, uh, which is the, the, you know, the genetic element of your personality, essentially. Uh, and we have a lot of evidence since the 80s and especially 90s to, uh, to, to demonstrate that. Uh, that it's not just a theory out there, it's a highly valid, highly confirmable uh, set of theories. And again, I've said many times, it doesn't fully explain human behavior, but it explains the, the vast majority of it. Uh, in fact, genes have been linked to uh, up to about 50% or so of um, your actual uh, behavioral uh, determinism. Uh, and we have uh, good evidence for that. The other 50%, of course, is uh, a mix of environmental factors, mostly epigenetic factors and exposure to hormones and things like that. Uh, but they, they have found about a 10-ish percent um, variance uh, for ability and, and personality that's based upon um, the actual socio-cultural environment. So it's there. Uh, it's, just, it's just smaller. So uh, here we go. Let's talk about this. Um, these theories, uh, again, focus on... They focus on physiological, so this is just like uh, the, the, the processes of your body uh, as far as they um, go re regarding how you feel and act. Uh, so your physiology uh, would be neurotransmitters, hormones, things like that. Um, and then of course how those are linked to uh, genes. Uh, while they're not entirely determined upon them, uh, they're just largely uh, contributed to uh, your uh, genetic uh, inherited uh, genes. So. Uh, for physiological uh, and uh, genetic factors to explain uh, personality, one's personality. Uh, their common set of uh, characteristics and behaviors over time. Um, and the, 
evidence for this is going to be largely based upon some new developments that are going to uh, form, not form, I should say, but uh, be shaped and, and come into existence uh, in the 1990s. One of them is going to be um, something that's known as the Human Genome Project. This was a uh, quest of several countries, most notably the United States, they had the biggest contributions to this, uh, as well as uh, Germany, the UK, France, Japan, and China. Uh, Germany and Japan contributing uh, more than the others, but and with the US the most, but they all do contribute to this. Uh, it's basically a project from 1990, uh, and I think it was declared completed, roughly speaking, by 2003. And in this particular project, what they did was they attempted to break down all of the uh, millions and millions and millions of uh, molecular uh, st structures in, your, in our DNA to try to find, um, uh, to, what's the word we're looking for? Uh, to not catalog, but to uh, describe or uh, provide a, uh, an understanding, a model, that's what we're looking for, uh, of our um, genetic structure and our alleles. So those, those genes, uh, what, what they're composed of, what they look like, and then which ones function together collectively. Uh, and interact with one another. Uh, and they found that, I think there's roughly 30,000 genes or something like that. Uh, I might have that number wrong. Um, and it's not in the entire, by the way, uh, you know, chromosome and DNA strand. It's only like 92% of it or so. Uh, but uh, they cataloged that. It took 13 years and all sorts of universities, uh, Stanford, uh, MIT, all sorts of big names uh, are involved in this research project. But they do. Uh, they're able to uh, catalog uh, the... Uh, a significant proportion, most of human uh, genes slash alleles. So it doesn't mean they know what they do, but they know what they are and they have their own functions. Uh, then it becomes, the, then follows the task of finding out what these genes actually do. Uh, so once we know what they are, that allows us to play with them and to see what genes do what. Now you don't just know, by looking at individuals' genes, if you didn't know anything else, it would tell you nothing. It'd be like, well, here's what it looks like, but you wouldn't know what did what, what was what, what affected what, you'd have no idea. You can do that by experimenting, because there's a couple ways you can do this. First of all, uh, they're going to uh, use what are called, um, uh, what do they call them? Knockout mice, there we go. I know they're not like boxing mice. Uh, knockout mice studies. So what they do is they, they take mice, and, and by the way, if you didn't know this, most organisms, um, Mammals certainly uh, have a very similar genetic structure. Uh, not many of the genes change to actually uh, produce these species differences, but I mean, it doesn't allow us to reproduce. Um, so we're, we're only like a, a couple percent away from being dolphins, you know, that sort of, that's like the running joke um, in, in the medical field. Like, oh, it's only off by one count of one percent. It's like, well, one percent off in, the, in our genes and we'd be dolphins. Um, what they do with mice is they would take, especially the, the common structures we have with mice in our brains, they would uh, pretty much just uh, use synthetic DNA to uh, block out or knock out certain genes and then see what happens to the mouse and see uh, how it affects their behavior uh, or their physical appearance and growth. Uh, and they kind of go through that. So that's a, that's a long process that's still ongoing. Uh, but they do get a good idea of how genes impact our brain function, uh, our behavior, and then of course our physical, um, um, physical bodies as well. Uh, we also are able to uh, genetically test people, and then since we know what the genome looks like, uh, we can log their genes or specific ones and then uh, compare them. Uh, so that way we can put all this stuff into these gigantic uh, data pools of thousands or millions of people potentially, uh, and then we can sort of find out some commonalities. So they could find out potentially if they've got like 30,000 sets of people's genes in there, and they're able to like find, I don't know, uh, a couple, uh, a couple hundred people that have schizophrenia, uh, they could possibly notice, I don't know if this is true or not, I'm just giving an example. They could notice that, oh, look, uh, all the people or most of the people that have schizophrenia, uh, this gene is different. It's mutated or not active or, or, or whatever. Uh, and that might be a good indicator that this might make you more likely to experience uh, schizophrenia or, or even cause it perhaps. Uh, in some way. So that's going to allow us to conduct a wide-scale um, human association uh, data analysis. So just over the years, and this is still ongoing, in fact those uh, genetic history tests are part of this too. They kind of, uh, you agree when you get them to essentially like 
allow them to use your genes uh, in their database uh, for studies like this. Um, so uh, that's the uh, Human Gene Association uh, database that they're able to do. And they also can do this too uh, with, um, this isn't related to genes. In fact, I should actually uh, create the category. Um, another way that they're able to confirm that genes uh, uh, and biology and physiology play a large role. And of course, genes, by the way, uh, largely underpin uh, your physiological and your biological structures of your brain. We've talked about that before in Unit 2, uh, so that should be hopefully known by now. Uh, if not, go back to Unit 2 and review uh, in the videos. But uh, your genes largely uh, impact your physiology, uh, your, the behavior of your nerves, uh, your sensitivity to certain uh, neurotransmitters, uh, the presence or lack of presence of certain hormones, which can affect your behavior and development. Um, the circuits in your brain, uh, how they work, how well they might work or not work, what abilities you may or may not have, how well you get are those. Those are all uh, underpinned, at least partially, uh, by uh, your actual genes as far as how your brain's designed and things like that. So uh, they're able to, uh, of course, see how the genes affect these uh, various uh, structures and, and, and behaviors and, and, and phenomena. Uh, but also, they're able to look at um, examples of People who are much more rare, but they offer great insight. Um, people who have psychological disorders or who have experienced some sort of brain trauma, uh, for example. So somebody uh, like the Phineas Gage example in 1848, the guy that, uh, who had the railroad spike go through his uh, uh, frontal lobe, uh, and he was fine, he didn't die. He had his regular range of emotions and all of that, uh, but his personality totally changed, um, as people know, even back in the 19th century. Uh, so cases like that, and obviously we have way more cases now, that was just an initial one, uh, show uh, where someone goes through an event, they get in a crash, whatever, they have a stroke, uh, part of their brain is damaged, whether it's a lesion or whatever, uh, and their personality will totally change, or their abilities will totally change, just because part of their brain is different or, or, or damaged. Uh, so we have examples, many more examples now, especially since the, the advent of the internet, we're able to share data a lot more easily. Uh, you have um, a lot of um, data uh, regarding psychological disorders, particularly rare ones, rare ones. And that allows us to look at differences in the brain that might explain, you know, uh, what predisposes somebody to uh, uh, be uh, psychopathic or, or, or sociopathic or um, things like that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, the, the damage, the trauma, like the Phineas Gage thing, that allows us to see how parts of your brain might affect your personality. So psychological disorders and uh, uh, brain trauma. And the last one is, uh, this is part of the cognitive revolution, but in the 1990s and early 2000s, they're going to develop a lot better machines for scanning your brain that allow us to much more clearly look at what's going on in your brain at the time, whether it's fMRIs or EEGs or PET scans. Um, and again, if you forgot those were, you go back to unit one uh, and look, those are just ways that we can look at your brain while it's operating without cutting people open. Um, that allows us to see how people's brains behave differently. Uh, and that uh, we're able to take that information and see how one's brain behaves, whether it's uh, regarding personality or emotion, uh, or uh, which is related, uh, or in intellect, whatever it might be. We can see how it operates, which regions are more active than others, and then we can uh, also uh, correlate that uh, to uh, uh, genetic structures as well with this with data that we've uh, acquired. So we can find out what parts of the brain handle what much more easily with these scans. I should put that, by the way. Um, advanced scanning tools from 1990 onward. So like EEG is going to be uh, advanced PET scan uh, and the fMRI was a big one too. That allows us to see what parts of the brain are doing what more specifically down to the very specific tiny regions uh, and that's uh, able to show us what parts of the brain uh, play a role in or, or cause certain behaviors or abilities, and then we can also tie those to uh, the genetic information that we have. So the merger of these uh, two or three groups, you could say, uh, combined to show us that uh, uh, physiology, biology, and specifically genes, which affect the, the other two, profoundly impact uh, one's personality uh, and then behavior. So uh, what are the tools we use for assessing this? Well, we've already got some of these. Um, one of the best uh, tools for assessing one's trait personality, uh, aside from, of course, these tests that actually look at your brain and, and look at your genes, um, we can see how people behave regarding their personality 
uh, in a few ways. Number one, uh, we have case studies, so how to, to assess personality. So again, this is, uh, of course, regarding uh, how we know that genes and biology uh, play a major role in, in determining behavior. But uh, if we're trying to look at uh, personality as far as what our preferences are, what our temperament is, etc., cetera, uh, there's ways to actually find that um, uh, and measure that scientifically, even though you think there might not be. Uh, so first one is going to be case studies. And that's, of course, looking at individuals or, or an individual group and seeing how their behavior uh, or, or you know, personality is affected by uh, particular, um, particular uh, factors, uh, whether it's a, a brain injury or common genes or not common genes, whatever it might be. Case studies are big. So uh, Phineas Gage is an example of one. So any, any, any uh, examples of uh, psychological disorders or brain trauma, so psych disorders? Brain trauma. Uh, other examples, and these ones were very uh, crucial uh, links to uh, providing insight on personality, behavior, even intellectual ability uh, with genes and biology. And that's going to be twin studies, which we talked about in Unit 2. I'll give you a brief, brief uh, reminder, though. Uh, twin studies showed us that um, if you take identical twins that have the same genetic uh, sequence, like right down the line. Uh, and this doesn't happen frequently, but uh, they're split at birth. So they have totally different surroundings, maybe a different culture, raised totally differently than we know about each other. Uh, it turns out that they end up more identical in behavior and appearance too, in ability, than, uh, than anyone, uh, even people that are uh, grouped and raised together. Uh, and they found that the genes were responsible for roughly half of that behavior, and then the other, have contributed to mostly uh, epigenetic environmental effects and then uh, the actual culture and upbringing was about 10% or so. Uh, so twin studies give us an excellent set of insights. So they looked at identical twins uh, and fraternal twins. Uh, that's another comparison. So uh, identical twins that are separated at birth when they turn out very, very, very similar, even though they have totally different uh, upbringings, uh, that's a really good indicator that um, uh, genes play a major role in personality. They also looked at uh, identical and fraternal twins so those are twins, identical having the same genes, fraternal having different genes, just the same difference level as, as siblings do that are not twins at all. So they're, they're uh, both raised in the same environment and household. Uh, so it turns out that um, the identical twins raised together uh, were far more identical, obviously, in um, behavior and ability than the fraternal twins. And it turns out the fraternal twins are only about as similar as just any set of siblings. Uh, so that would show gives a good set of uh, uh, data to show that um, uh, genes and, and biology play a major role. Uh, and then lastly, we have adoption studies, uh, which is another control for environment, where you take a biological uh, child and give it to a, a set of parents that are, have no biological relation, <clears throat> and they grow up in an entirely different environment. And uh, lo and behold, despite being raised from uh, a baby to adulthood, they end up becoming personality and ability-wise uh, much more similar to their biological parents. If they don't know, they never had uh, a, a different set of parents that were their biological parents, uh, whether they're aware of it or not, uh, or they had contact with or not. They're more similar to their biological parents than the uh, foster parents that have, have raised them their whole life. So those are excellent sets of studies. So twin studies and um, adoption studies. Uh, case studies, uh, nonetheless, include all of those, and those are some excellent examples that show the role of biology and genes uh, in human behavior and personality. Another one are, and these are two actually related ones I'm going to explain together, surveys and questionnaires. People often use these interchangeably and, and, and mix them up, uh, so I'm going to say that they're linked here. They're not, the, I shouldn't actually put that, so make you think of the same thing. Surveys. Uh, contain questionnaires in them, but surveys are basically when you're trying to figure out uh, an opinion amongst a lot of people or you're trying to gather information on people's personalities, like what they like, what they don't like, what they would do in this situation or in that situation, um, uh, how, how they spend their day, things like that, things they're interested in. That is a series of questions that you would put onto you know, a piece of paper on a computer or whatever. It could be 50 questions, could be 200 questions, whatever it would be. 
The actual question set is obviously the questionnaire. The survey though is you sending out a bunch of questionnaires, getting them all back, and then uh, trying to analyze uh, the, the data, right? To see like, oh, okay, uh, these people all answered this way, and these people all answered this way. I wonder if there's any similarities uh, in those sets of questions. Uh, so surveys and questionnaires can be used to uh, uh, gather personality information. So this is essentially um, uh, distributing and analyzing uh, questionnaires. about personality. And in these, uh, people of course are trying to, uh, you're asking people questions uh, and trying to assess what their personality is or, or roughly is. Uh, and then the questionnaires of course are the actual uh, uh, questions uh, per individual about their personality. So you conduct surveys, you send out uh, and in these surveys, of course, uh, include, um, or a component of it, or the questionnaire. So the an individual would fill out the questionnaire, send it back, and then the survey would be you collecting them all, uh, entering all the information, and then looking for any uh, correlations or any uh, uh, factors you can find that are common amongst the questions or people groups. Uh, that's you analyzing the data. That would be the survey. These are the primary ways that we assess personality and, and have shown us that this is the uh, most influential and uh, well, the most significant factor in determining your personality and your behavior. Uh, so that is the, those are those studies. And is that all I want to say before we go into the specifics? I'm trying to think if I forgot anything. I don't think, yeah, I think I got all the stuff that I want to talk about. So now that we understand sort of how um, we look at these. Oh, I remember. I remember now what I want to talk about. Um, the types of tests that these uh, include um, are what you would consider objective tests, not projective tests. So projective tests are like ones that we've already talked about. In fact, I'll put it up here real quick. Uh, projective tests are not nearly as reliable uh, for being consistent or finding an answer about somebody. Uh, these have to deal with uh, you uh, attempt attempting to figure out what's going on in your unconscious, so unconscious uh, uh, decoders. Uh, that includes examples like the Rorschach's inkblot test, inkblot, uh, or uh, the thematic, uh, uh, thematic a perception test. I'll just put TAS. I'll write it out. TAT test. Uh, and that's the one, of course, where you're, you're looking at the ambiguous situation. So uh, Rorschach, of course, the inkblot, what do you see? And they try to, you know, find any tendencies or patterns in what you see, uh, and that's supposed to reveal your unconscious. Uh, and then the, uh, the TAT tests are like the ambiguous stories where you have to explain how the story occurred or what the image is or whatever it might be. Uh, that, that's how you, how you would try to figure it out. These are very unreliable, so scientifically unreliable. However, when properly constructed, uh, a different type of test can be very, very accurate. Uh, those are called objective tests. So here we're not trying to like decode your unconscious. We're actually just having you uh, specifically tell us what you, you think or what you like, etc. So this is very uh, a conscious recollection uh, or answering uh, of questions uh, to analyze or determine uh, your personality. Um, when we do this, we, we form these objective tests and we uh, issue them in surveys. Uh, when we try to analyze the data and, and, and figure out uh, what the factors are and what groups of people fit what and you know uh, those sorts of features, uh, that's known as psychometrics we've talked about before. Uh, and that's, of course, you trying to measure or figure out um, what the, the, the connecting underlying data is uh, amongst groups of people psychologically. Uh, so psychometrics uh, can look to measure intelligence uh, by issuing tests and analyzing the data, uh, or uh, it can, um, psychometrics can re refer to personality, uh, or the same thing, issuing out surveys, and then people f uh, fill them out, and you bring them back together and try to figure out what the common themes are and uh, what you can identify about uh, common human uh, personality uh, and behavior. So that's how you do it. 
Let's begin then, since we already, I already covered this, this is an adequate set of explanations for how we know it's true. Uh, let's go over the, the history of what traits and tests people uh, developed uh, that eventually led to the very, very accurate ones of the 90s and early 2000s that allowed us to um, uh, actually find what are the common underlying factors in human uh, personality and what impact they have on your actual behavior. All right, so some of the early tests. Um, the, one of the, this isn't first chronologically, although I think probably the research for this was begun the earliest. I think it's went back to the 1910s even, but came out in the, 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 the 40s. This is what's known as the Myers-Briggs test. Uh, inventory or test, I can't remember exactly what it's referred to. Um, but it's a personality test. And this is much like the uh, surveys we were talking about, where you give people questionnaires and they fill it out and then you uh, try to uh, measure which traits they have uh, or which ones they don't have. So this was started by, uh, and again, this is roughly in the 1940s. I think 1944 is when it came out, but don't quote me. I'll say 1940s to be safe. Uh, this was uh, first devised, at least in this form, uh, to try to be a, an objective test, one that you could measure scientifically um, uh, and, and psychometrically by, um, her name is Catherine, Catherine um, Briggs, and uh, her daughter, um, Isabel, I think, uh, Myers Briggs. That was because of a marriage. Um, so, that becomes, uh, those are the ones that did the research. And they were influenced actually by Carl Jung, of all people. Uh, not his psychometric, uh, no, sorry, not his uh, psychoanalytical approach per se, but they definitely liked one aspect that he tried to capture um, of, of human personality and that he believed people operated by like four common uh, uh, underlying conscious and unconscious features. I think it was, I might say them wrong, I think it was intuition, feeling, thinking, and sensing, I think. Uh, so influenced by Carl Jung, I shouldn't just write Carl Jung, that's making sense. Uh, influenced by Carl Jung's uh, uh, theory on feeling, intuition, thinking, and sensing, or sensation that underlie behavior. Uh, so, and in fact, they, they gave him direct credit for inspiring the idea, uh, but they put together a, a, a non, a non uh, projective test, a much more uh, objective test, and that people are just consciously answering uh, questions to try to figure out what their personality is, uh, as far as like what they like, dislike, what they would do, what they wouldn't do, et cetera. Uh, so they put together this, uh, uh, psych uh, this psychometric uh, an analysis by a, a survey, I should say personality survey. And then while, uh, while this test is not accurate, like it, it's been rejected as pseudoscience uh, because it's attempted to be scientific, but it doesn't have actual scientific results. Uh, like the, the, the findings are not consistent, they're not uh, valid. Uh, uh, being not repeatable, etc., cetera. Uh, and they also have a whole bunch of, uh, the 16 different personalities it claims to, that there are, uh, there's a bunch of uh, correlations between the two, or between others that, that show that it's probably less uh, than what they're looking for, or at least the factors are less. Uh, and they did this intentionally uh, to try to find, be able to, to uh, find out people's personalities, to put them in jobs they like, specifically women during World War II, who were going to industrial uh, sector, because most of the men were off uh, fighting in World War II, that uh, they were unfamiliar with and they didn't know what they would be best suited for. So that's what they tried to make the test for. Um, so it, uh, based on your answers, it's going to place you into one of 16 different personalities, 16 personality types. Oops, personality types. Uh, and those um, are gonna have like common sets of characteristics about like, oh, you enjoy these things, this is how you are in relationships, this is how you uh, are uh, at your work, et cetera. It gives you some like general ideas about how you are. Uh, and you might even find if you take a Myers-Briggs test because they are available, um, 
that it's somewhat accurate, but you'll find that it's not entirely accurate. Uh, and the problem is um, it's not gonna be consistent amongst populations. And there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of uh, intercorrelation between uh, the, the groups that, that shouldn't exist um, if they're actually separate things. Because if you're trying to measure and find out what the root root factors of personality are, and you've got a bunch of things that, that correlates, like, well, then they're probably the same thing, or at least partly, so you need to find out what the actual underlying factor is. Um, so these personality types, uh, it's a combination of different traits. Um, there is, I might not remember all of them. There's extroversion, version, introversion. That's, of course, your outgoingness. Uh, I think there is, oh, man, sense, Sensitivity or sensation. What's the other one? Intuition. There we go. Uh, the other is um, thinking and judgment. I might have some of these mixed up, but uh, what are the other ones? Um, perception. And is that one feeling? I don't remember if that one's feeling or not. Well, this might not be feeling. Nonetheless, they give you some categories, uh, and then of course, based on your response, they'll give you like this four letter uh, um, uh, acronym that'll be like, let's say you scored in uh, extroversion, intuition, thinking, and perception. They'd be like, oh, look, so like you're um, E N T uh, P, because they just start them with the first letter, except for intuition, because there's two I's. They make that an, uh, an N instead of an I. That's how they mark them. I should have underlined it here. Right, and if you uh, happen to answer uh, the opposite, uh, almost the answers, they would classify your categorize you as uh, the opposite of this, which would be uh, I, uh, S, J, F. Uh, and they would say, oh, these types of people have these qualities and do these things and like these things. And, these type of people have these types of qualities to do these things. Obviously, this will be more extroverted centered, this will be more introverted centered, uh, and so on. But that's how they try to classify it. So not correct, but um, a, a good attempt nonetheless. So that was one of the first initial attempts. It does, however, provide us with a good uh, basis for how to try to uh, construct objective tests and, and map personality. Um, another one that's going on about the same time, actually, is what's called the Minnesota, but for different purposes. Minnesota multiphasic personality, it's a long one, inventory. Uh, we can just call it MMPI. And this test was not just set out for looking for um, personality, but it's also looking to measure uh, psychopathy or, or the degree to which uh, an individual is abnormal psychologically. Usually dealing with psychological disorders. Not just in, oh, they're quirky, uh, but I mean like, oh, this person has a lot of antisocial behaviors, or they think things exist that don't, like um, they're having delusions or hallucinations, or they're losing touch with reality, or they're crippled by anxiety to the point that they can't leave their house. Those are what I'm talking about, psychological disorders. Not like, oh, he likes weird things. That's not what I mean. Psychopathy means you have a set of behaviors uh, or perceptions that actually make your life more difficult. They're, they're called maladaptive uh, behaviors or, or tendencies. Um, so they make it much, much, much harder to uh, live a, a, a life that uh, consistently and stably uh, can interact with others and, and operates uh, in a healthy manner uh, to themselves and others. Those we mean by psychological disorders. Uh, so this is in the uh, 1940s, 30s and 40s. Important that they still use this, and um, it's, it's been revised several times. So the original 1930s, 40s version has been updated four or five times at least. Um, and what they're looking for, again, is it's, a, it's, it's also a, a type of a survey. Survey. Although this is much more questionnaire-centered because this is where you go in and answer it once, and they compare it to a pool of data. But the uh, data that was pooled was formed uh, from surveys. So a survey... Uh, to determine, or uh, um, um, not catalog, identify uh, personality and psychopathy. 
And that's its primary purpose, by the way. It's trying to see how much differently you answer uh, than other people do. So normal people that don't have psychological disorders, uh, which you consider normal, I suppose, um, they have a, a general range of normal responses uh, to certain questions. So there might be some pretty obscure questions like, is it okay to uh, 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 pick your nose in public or, or you know, just weird questions like that. Um, and then based on the responses to that, they can try to determine how far off the norm you are. Uh, and it's not just random uh, as far as how off the, away from the norm you are. What they did was they intentionally uh, inventoried uh, known uh, uh, patients, no, known individuals with psychological disorders. So they would take people that have like um, depression uh, or schizophrenia or, or whatever, and they would take these questionnaires and they would try to see how similarly all the people who were schizophrenic or all the people who were depressed or, or suffering from whatever anxiety disorder, how they answered. And they would make that the normal curve for depression or anxiety or, or, or whatever it might be, right? So if I take the test and I uh, answer it and it aligns with that roughly, that might indicate that I have that psychological disorder. So that's how it's used largely. Uh, it's used to, uh, uh, I would say, contemporary use is uh, going to be to uh, uh, diagnose, especially differentially when uh, somebody's got uh, an issue that's it's unclear because they have a bunch of characteristics from other disorders and it's not clear what they have. This can help provide some insight as to what it likely is or might be. So it can help diagnose, diagnose, um, treat, set up treatment plans, because if you are aware of what it is or what they suffer from, you can better align any medication or therapy uh, that you're going to use. Um, diagnose, treat, uh, and, and even screen people uh, for uh, uh, job positions. There's other roles you can use it for, too. For. They can also use it for forensic devices, like seeing if somebody uh, is potentially suffering from a psychological disorder that may have exploited their crime or their role in the crime, whatever it might be. Uh, that's what it's primarily used for uh, nowadays. It's been updated, like I said, several times, taken on the computer. Um, but if you're like, wow, I want to see what I might have or so-and-so might have, you can't because this is not available to the public. Um, it can only be obtained by uh, its own, first of all, or at least, at least initially was owned by the uh, uh, University of Minnesota, the ones that developed it. I don't know if they still have the, the rights to it or not because it's been more than... 70 years, but 73 years, but, um, or 76 years, whatever it is for copyright uh, uh, privileges. Nonetheless, uh, you have to be a, a physician, um, a clinical psychologist, a psychiatrist to even obtain this uh, test and administer it uh, and, and assess it. Even if you could take the test and see the results, you would have to actually analyze what the results meant uh, because the clusters of responses in certain, certain sections uh, may indicate certain uh, propensity or likelihood of having a certain disorder. Uh, so it is a, uh, a closed slash private test, uh, only accessible by um, uh, clinical psychologists or psychiatrists. So those are the ones that can use it. So that's the uh, MMPI. Um, while again, it's not that impactful on personality theory per se, it's really good at uh, guiding uh, or informing one of, of any potential behavior or personality abnormalities that might exist. All right, <laughs> staying here in the 1940s, on our last uh, uh, lead up test here would be um, somebody who attempted to build upon or improve the uh, model started by uh, the Myers-Briggs model, and Jung too, uh, and that was by Hans Eysenck, uh, and uh, that's known as the Eysenck Personality uh, Questionnaire. Uh, he's had multiple different forms of, of, of uh, personality tests that led up to this, um, like he had a personality inventory and then he merged it with another one, he worked with his wife on this one, uh, but this is the one that uh, Probably the most influence. So again, by Hans Eysenck. Hans Eysenck. 
uh, and his wife, I don't remember her first name, but it was Mrs. Eisenstein. Uh And she was, I believe her contributions were more later. I might be wrong about that though. Um, Hans Einsink is the one that uh, is going to uh, largely contribute to this, and it's uh, meant to uh, build on uh, previous um, uh, trait surveys. So he was actually, I think he was initially anyway, a behaviorist, but he um, recognized, kind of like uh, Bandura did, that there are influences on one's behavior uh, outside of just um, learned behaviors <clears throat> uh, due to external uh, stimuli and their consequences. So uh, he was a, a behaviorist, or at least initially was, uh, that acknowledged influence of trait on temperament. And again, that's the uh, genetic personality factor. Uh, he even said uh, there might be some of the some of the issues he's talking about might be learned, but um, he believes that the ones he's focusing on are likely uh, genetic, uh, genetically inherited uh, or traits, uh, and that others would have to work out which ones were learned and which ones weren't. Uh, but he had some uh, important contributions. He was obvious. He was involved in many other ones too. Some of them pretty controversial, but uh, this one was less controversial. And it's kind of like I'm oversimplifying here my explanation. It's kind of like a bridge between the modern or the contemporary versions of a uh, trait test, which we'll get to the big five factors, uh, and the Myers-Briggs, which was totally inaccurate. And this one's got some degree of accuracy. In fact, two of the, the main traits are gonna be used largely uh, by the big five factor test because they're very similar. Uh, but he's gonna uh, not be entirely correct. And again, he's gonna, this test is going to suffer from the same plight as previous tests in that they are, uh, there's underlying factors that aren't assessed because some things uh, correlate together that, that are probably the same thing. Uh, and it's not as accurate or valid as it would need to be to, to actually pass the scrutiny of, 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 of testing by a multitude of psychologists like the big five factor is, uh, but we're not there yet. So this is from the 1940s and updated in, uh, until essentially the 1980s when the, uh, Big five factors, especially in the 1990s, by the way, uh, began to uh, rise in popularity and significance. Uh, he's going to try to identify two primary traits. He does have a third one. Um, but the two primary traits he's going to focus on are extroversion and um, neuroticism. So what I mean by that is uh, extroversion is pretty much one's sensitivity or preference for positive emotion, and uh, especially external. And then uh, neuroticism is one's uh, sensitivity to uh, negative emotion. So somebody who is neurotic would be uh, prone to um, things like uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, they might be, um, if they're particularly neurotic, they might be emotionally unstable, so they could get very angry or sad um, uh, or lonely uh, frequently and, and intensely and for long periods of time, emotionally unstable. And the opposite of that, because it's, it's kind of a spectrum uh, to him, um, that would be, of course, emotional stability. So somebody who is the opposite of those things hardly ever gets uh, depressed or anxious. They don't get stressed very often. Uh, they have a good uh, handle on their emotions and they are um, somebody who um, doesn't really get stressed unless there's a major, major stress factor. Uh, so that's what would be neurotic uh, persons. Emotionally stable, of course, would be, um, well, as it suggests, emotionally stable, so resistant to, to anxiety, depression, stress, etc. cetera. Uh, and they just generally have a good handle on their emotions. Extroversion, that is, um, it's opposite being, of course, introversion. Introversion. Uh, extroversion was um, believed by, I think, to be have to deal with being outgoing, uh, social, and active, uh, seeking external um, stimulation. And I think he actually tied it to the Yerkes-Dodson model about how 
people need optimum levels of stimulation and uh, those who are extroverted uh, have a, a high threshold for that. So like you would say, I suppose, if you're talking about drive theories or arousal theory, uh, their required level of arousal um, to, to, to maintain uh, normalcy, um, homeostasis would be a high degree of, of, of external activity and stimulation. Just like the Yerkes-Dodson model, you'd like this ideal one that dips, that's what a, an extrovert would be. Uh, they have this ideal amount of, of engagement interaction, uh, and you could uh, perhaps overstimulate them, but you could more likely understimulate them. Uh, introverts are the opposite. Uh, if you take that same yerkes dodson approach, you would just move it over, or that arousal theory approach, you just move it over to say that they require very little stimulation to be optimal, uh, and that it quickly uh, dips off afterwards. So uh, introverts would be, of course, um, uh, much more internally focused, uh, quiet, reserved, uh, and they would uh, be less active. He also added, and this one was not very easy for him to verify. Oh, before I mention that, I should say what the test results might look like. It would kind of place you on a spectrum here, uh, like a, a four-piece pie, where you'd have, um, I can't remember the exact order they were in, but you'd have kind of an extroversion side and an introversion side and a neurotic side and an emotionally stable side. And you'd be kind of uh, pinned along here uh, and it'd have you a host of characteristics that sort of define your position on that uh, spectrum. Uh, that's where you would kind of fall. Um, he does add a, a third category known as psychotism as well as socialization. Um, this one's not very much verifiable. This one has to do a lot with uh, antisocial disorders and aggression. So ones that are uh, high on the uh, uh, psychoticism uh, spectrum would be prone to psychological disorders uh, and aggression. And those that would be on the socialized part would be, of course, uh, resistant to those, resistant uh, and um, um, controlled. But that, I mean, honestly, that's really just a reflection of one's volatility, which is uh, a, a, another factor in, in neuroticism. And he tied this uh, physiologically to uh, the hormone testosterone. But again, especially this portion here, not really uh, psychometrically valid, but he does start people on the path to identifying some actual underlying factors because these actually are um, even the way he described it with, with a bit more detail uh, and nuance, those are largely true uh, today as far as traits go uh, that you inherit and, and largely are biologically motivated or biologically uh, dependent. So having said that, um, this model would of course be abandoned, but some of its uh, theories and fundamentals would carry on in the current model that is incredibly accurate and the roots go back, I think, even as far as like the 1960s, but they didn't become known academically, at least the theories, um, on finding some common factors in human behavior and, and trying to link that to personality. Uh, so this is the 1990s onwards when it becomes more uh, relevant and um, uh, verifiable. This is what we know as the <coughs> big five factors. Uh, of personality. Let's get right. Um, this was popularized, like I said, it, it sort of go back to the 60s and the 80s especially, but it becomes a lot more mainstream and well the internet of course is going to help within the 90s with the development and, and integration of the internet. <coughs> it's going to be several different researchers working independently that find their work all aligns rather well. And that of course is great scientifically because like, that means it's like replicatable right off the bat because multiple people come to the same conclusion of the same data that all lines up roughly speaking. Uh, that's a, it's a wonderful phenomenon and a great way to demonstrate it is uh, likely valid. So <coughs> big five factors. Uh, this is a, a set of uh, beliefs that um, uh, are a theory that asserts uh, human personality is largely determined by um, genetic 
components that are, I guess you could say, grouped into five, hence the five, basic factors. So there's basically five different ways to look at, <clears throat> or five different characteristics or traits uh, that people possess. And the behaviors and like subcategories within these are all commonly linked. So that means that um, if I have a certain set of behaviors, like let's say, for example, I am super interested in uh, ideas that are abstract, like abstract math, or how uh, economic systems work, um, or how things work mechanically, or how people uh, behave. Those are all abstract ideas that you, you can't see, and it's hard to, to comprehend. It requires a lot of time and data and intelligence to do so. If I like things like that, uh, and I also like, no, let me rephrase that. If I like those things about abstract ideas, uh, that's me. And then they, they, they question somebody else about how they feel uh, about uh, having ideas and, and learning about new ideas and creating new ideas. Uh, and if they like it or they do that, that well or often, those are two different things, right? One deals with, I like abstract ideas and, and problem solving. And the other is I like listening to ide new ideas and developing them. Um, they found that people that answered yes to these questions, they like them largely respond similarly about questions uh, for the other type, which was about, you know, more uh, uh, creative uh, exposure to new ideas sort of thing. So if I'm answering the same in one category as I am in the other category, and, and I find other people that answer the same in both, uh, that is known as a factor, the underlying factor. Uh, and in this case, it would be openness. So uh, that's what they're looking for. This was, of course, um, it goes back decades, but the, the researchers that really brought it to prominence, but first of all were, um, oh, what was his name? Lewis Goldberg? First name might be wrong, but it was Goldberg. Um, he's gonna help um, popularize it and develop it in the 1990s. Uh, but the two that are really gonna uh, advance the theories and, and consolidate them and codify them are Paul Cost Jr. And uh, Robert, I might pr pronounce his last name uh, incorrectly, but uh, McCrow or McCray. Those uh, are the uh, two primary, although Goldberg also contributes, uh, developers of this theory. And these two especially are going to assert uh, a couple of things before we talk about what the actual five factors are. They're going to determine that um, personality, they're going to assert anyway, personality is... Uh, largely stable across the lifetime, especially after age 30. So your personality uh, in your late 20s, early 30s, uh, that's pretty much you uh, going forward. And that is not a, um, that's not a, a controversial claim at this point because it is well documented by hordes of research uh, through these guys and others that again, personality stays relatively stable uh, uh, throughout your life, certainly. Um, it does vary, of course, more extremely at the beginning until you hit you know, puberty and all that. But uh, certainly by age 30, it's pretty damn consistent all the way through. Uh, they also are gonna uh, find out that uh, personality is a, uh, personality is uh, a major determinant in behavior. So the way you behave, even if it's in various situations, like change the situation, it doesn't matter as much uh, as does your underlying uh, trait personality. Because how I behave when I'm rock climbing or uh, when I'm doing it with people or without people or whether it's dangerous or not, um, the situation doesn't nearly matter as much as the underlying uh, factor that I'm looking at. So if I care if my friends are at this rock climbing thing or not, that's not actually what we're looking at. We're looking at how much do I like being there with other people? Uh, that's extroversion, right? that's an underlying trait. And that applies to any situation that deals with people. Um, if, I'm, if my attendance, and of course I'm using Alfred, Al, Albert Bandura's uh, social cognitive uh, example about the reciprocal determinism, 
uh, and, and traits and environment and experience. Uh, if I am, uh, let's say I've had a bad experience with rock climbing, I've gotten hurt doing it or I've gotten hurt doing other things that are similar to it, um, the likelihood that I'll go is not so much the situation to ha have I been hurt or do I know about being hurt um, falling from rocks or, or, or rock climbing. It's uh, my sensitivity to negative emotion, which would apply with rock climbing or racing or jumping or playing a sport, anything. Uh, my sensitivity to that negative emotion, that negative experience uh, versus the positive um, of, of, of accomplishing the task or doing it, that's going to impact my decision far more than the actual situation itself. So the underlying causes are, are, uh, are, uh, are, are factors, um, emotional factors, or not emotional factors, sorry, trait factors that we, uh, that they are going to assess here. All right. And the last one, what was the last one I wanted to talk about? I forgot what it was. Largely stable after 30, major determining factor in behavior. Yeah. And they, they found that it's, um, consistent across various situations, which is really like what I just described. The actual situation is less significant than how you react to uh, what, what's the underlying factor in that situation. So do I have uh, a sensitivity, high sensitivity to negative emotion? Yeah, I'm going to almost certainly avoid uh, a rock climbing incident that could potentially be dangerous or, or uh, painful. But I'm also gonna apply that same thinking to any other event where um, I'm under threat of experiencing some form of negative emotion. That could even be non-physical too. I would maybe avoid a situation where I might fail in front of others and that would of course be humiliating, that would really uh, affect me negatively and I'd avoid that too. Um, that's what we mean by the situation doesn't matter so much as the underlying um, trait factor. All right, so that kind of establishes the gist of it. And they of course, by the way, are going to, uh, uh, I shouldn't say this is part of their, their claim, but these guys uh, are gonna be highly credible because their uh, findings are um, uh, consistent, uh, I should say highly consistent, highly consistent, uh, highly uh, valid, so they're, they're replicatable. Uh, and what's the other one? Oh, they are, um, they have sound, they use sound factor analysis. So the, the factors they analyze, they are highly correlated even between different researchers and situations. Uh, so that gives us a really good indication that uh, they're accurate. So there's no, there's not a whole lot of inconsistencies internally like, oh, well, they have two correlations here that we didn't lump together. No, the things that they do have lumped together, they do correlate uh, very, very, very highly. So anything that we describe here under like openness, which I already started describing, uh, one part of it's abstract uh, ideas and thought and problem solving, one part of it's uh, new ideas and, and, and a variety of ideas. Um, people that answer one way uh, on one category almost always answer the same way uh, on uh, the other one, right? So that would mean those two things are highly correlated, that's probably one factor, and then they lump that together in as, as openness. All right, so uh, they have sound factor analysis um, and their um, results are consistent and they're valid. Oh, and I remember the last one I was gonna mention. Uh, they are universal, these personality traits. Uh, meaning, even if I ask people in different cultures these questions, uh, they still have consistent, the same consistent responses and factors. So uh, that's controlling, of course, for, for sociocultural factors. So if I've got a set of questions Obviously, I have to translate in different languages. If I have a set of questions for people in different cultures and they all come out the same, that's a really good indicator that it's a, a, a genetic or biological feature uh, because it's universal and not dependent on my upbringing or surroundings. All right, so that's how we know their findings are valid. So let's talk about what their actual uh, theory is and what these five factors are. So I'm gonna go over this semi-quickly because there's a whole host of information to find this very easily. Uh, in fact, you could take tests. Uh, first thing I want to say though, no, first thing I want to do is describe the categories. The five factors are as such, openness to experience, uh, conscientiousness, oops, it's been thought wrong, there we go, there's a C in, no, um, extroversion, 
Uh, we've also got agreeableness. And then lastly, neuroticism. And you notice, of course, these two uh, are from iSyncs. They're, they're a, a bit different, but they're largely the same. Um, the only thing that they're going to do with the big five is they're going to identify three more major common factors, and that's agreeableness. And again, rem uh, just to remind you, there's going to be a little bit of, what's the word I'm looking for? Variance in the, uh, the definitions I'm going to give you. So I'm going to say, like, this could mean uh, qualities like this, one, two, three, and I give you three different things. The reason why we throw them all under this one category is because they're highly correlated, uh, meaning there's some sort of underlying factor that they label as openness to experience. So again, even though I might give you a couple different things here, what that means is people who answered the surveys, the questionnaires and the surveys, uh, the way they answered in one of the categories, they answered uh, very, very similarly in the other category. So then they lump them all under openness to experience. So here's some examples. Openness to experience. Uh, you can kind of subdivide this as um, uh, intellect, and I don't mean IQ, by the way. I mean interest in abstract ideas, uh, as well as, um, I don't want to say art, um, openness to, uh, hmm. I don't want to say creativity either, because it's not necessarily creativity, uh, or aesthetics. I'll, I'll say it's aesthetics, even though that's probably not the best term. I can't just say openness twice because I already use it here. But anyways, uh, intellect, I will, I will say openness. Yeah, okay, hold on. Openness to experience means I like getting a lot of different things. Uh, and here's two categories of different things, uh, intellect and openness. So intellect would mean uh, interest in abstract ideas and problem solving. And then openness uh, would be more so focused on um, uh, different ideas, uh, liking the way things look, aesthetics, like I mentioned here, appreciating art and literature, things like that. Um, so an appreciation for interest in art, beauty, literature, etc. And if you, uh, if you look at these, you're like, wait a second, those are all different things. Abstract and, and ideas and problem solving, uh, liking them, being interested in them, uh, versus things that are uh, beautiful and artistic and liter regarding literature, those are different things. And you're right, they are. Uh, but people that answered uh, one way here very commonly uh, aligned with their answers here. Uh, so they're highly correlated. Uh, and if they change the words on the test, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, as long as they have the same message, they correlate consistently. So they've lumped them in as one cat factor, which they've labeled as openness to experience. Conscientiousness. You've got two subcategories, industriousness. Well, more than two, I'm just give you two examples. And orderliness. Orderliness. So industriousness, what do I mean by that? I mean um, you really like um, producing things, productive. Uh, you don't, you fill your days. Uh, you are somebody who doesn't like to just hang around and do nothing or sit or, or, or play video games. No, I'm taking it back. You can play video games. Uh, but you're goal oriented, you want to achieve things. So you are like, oh, I've got to uh, write this book. So you will motivate, you have intrinsic motivation to go and do the research and write this thing. You don't need somebody pushing you to do it. You're gonna sit there and do it on your own and you'll enjoy it, you'll feel fulfilled by it and you won't, and you'll feel guilty if you don't do that. All right, so productive. Orderliness is much more um, centered around being organized. So, um, you know, I have an agenda, I know exactly what I'm gonna do, I have a plan for this, that, and the other. Uh, things are t tidy and clean. That's sort of what I mean by that. Uh, organized, uh, clean, etc. Are those different things? Yes, they are. But people that uh, answer one way in the industrious um, uh, set of questions, so like it's a bunch of questions about like, you know, uh, how often you work, how much you enjoy work, things like that. Do you like uh, being active in projects, whatever? Or do they have to be like, oh, I'm bothered when things are messy. Uh, I always have a schedule, things like that. People that answer one way in the uh, orderliness section uh, tend to answer the same way in the industrious section, or at least very closely. They're highly correlated. So they've lumped them together into one factor that they've labeled as conscientiousness. So if I'm a conscientious person, one who uh, scores highly here, uh, I probably am um, some version of being productive and or organized. Uh, probably, it can vary. I know, for example, uh, men tend to slightly 
uh, uh, score higher in industriousness than women in orderliness, but um, they're, they're both correlated. So if I'm high in one, I'm probably also high in the other, or at least close to it. <clears throat> All right, extroversion. Um, extroversion is, uh, what are the two for that one? Enthusiasm and assertiveness. Now, assertiveness is somebody who is uh, uh, very uh, active. They're the one that's going to speak out quick. They're usually the first ones to act. Uh, they, they take action. They enjoy doing things and getting things done. Not for productivity, but like they get enjoyment out of it uh, and they feel compelled to be the first one to speak up or to do something or to take action. Um, so that's uh, assertiveness. So take action, speak up first, etc. cetera. Uh, and enthusiasm is I really enjoy doing things uh, with other people. Uh, I enjoy uh, activities, talking to people, socializing. Uh, I, this is a positive emotion um, uh, factor. So uh, I, I like to stimulate myself. So um, uh, external stimulation. Of course, that can apply to assertiveness too. I shouldn't write that one. Um, but this is me being outgoing, sociable, uh, talkative, etc. Well, both will tend to talk a lot, but um, in slightly different ways. So uh, assertive is more like, I'm going to get this done, I'm going to do this now, you can't stop me, I'm going to go, go, go. Uh, whereas enthusiasm is more so, uh, I really enjoy doing these things, uh, and maybe uh, I'm not going to like, you know, push my agenda or be the first to do it, but I really am always going to be active because I like going places, seeing things, talking to people. I like the stimulation. Uh, this is a positive emotion factor. So people that scored, uh, uh, answered uh, one way in the service uh, portion, uh, we're highly correlated with their uh, answers with the enthusiasm portion, so we've loved, labeled that one as extroversion. Um, for all of these, you're gonna have the opposite. So these are all talking about qualities of people that, that would score highly, but you can score low in these categories too. Like if you, uh, if you don't like taking action, you don't like speaking up first, and you're not outgoing, and you, and you don't like seeing other people that often, well, that doesn't mean anything bad, that's just your personality. Uh, you'd be lower on the extroversion uh, spectrum, more towards the, what you would consider an introvert. Uh, same with conscientiousness. I might not be productive, right? I might just enjoy doing nothing. And in fact, being productive is bothersome to me. Um, if I have, like, have things to do and I've got a lot of work to get done, uh, or maybe I, uh, I'm annoyed or I'm not annoyed by some things being messy. In fact, I hate having schedules that feel confining. That would just mean somebody uh, is lower on the end, uh, spectrum here for conscientiousness. If I'm not interested in abstract ideas and I, and I like the, doing the same thing, uh, I like routines and I don't like you know, experiencing a bunch of different things and I don't care much about art and literature, uh, that just means I'm lower uh, in, in openness to experience. None of those are bad things. It just means that's just not what you like. All right, two more to go. And then we're done. Agreeableness. Uh, this one has to do with compassion and politeness. So compassion, meaning your concern for uh, other individuals. I don't mean necessarily as a group. Uh, if I'm somebody who uh, uh, really wants to uh, find new ways of solving social problems or economic problems, uh, and I'm interested in that, that might actually be an intellect thing. But I'm talking about like, I see somebody who is suffering and I have this overwhelming desire and interest in helping them. Uh, I'll feel guilty if I don't. I feel really good if I do. Uh, that's somebody who's going to be compassionate. So uh, uh, concern or interest in uh, struggles of others, particularly their struggles. Uh, and politeness is somebody who is, of course, going to be, as it uh, implies, polite. So that's somebody who doesn't want to say no. They don't want to disrupt things. They don't want to disagree. Uh, they don't want to um, uh, cause any sort of tension. Uh, so they want nothing but social har group harmony, uh, harmony between people. So they're very likable, um, but they will not usually speak up if they feel something is wrong. Um, so they're the ones that might not get what they want, um, potentially. Uh, but they uh, are liked because they're not somebody who's going to step on your toes or say mean things or disagree with you or cause tension. Uh, so these are going to be the people that are uh, nice, likable helpful. Compassion can be helpful as well. I shouldn't put that. Uh, nice, likable, and um, I don't want to say agreeable. 
uh, harmony, enjoy harmony, uh, value harmony. There we go. So um, if I'm an agreeable person, those are the traits I'm going to have. I'm a disagreeable person, though. Uh, I might have less uh, concern for uh, the individual plights of others. That could still mean, though, that I'm interested in uh, solving problems socially or economically that, that help people out and solve their problems. But uh, I don't have much empathy, uh, and I don't, I'm not like particularly moved by somebody who uh, might need help. Uh, maybe I'll feel guilty and I'll help them because I know it's a good thing, but I don't get like a positive uh, emotional response from it. I'm not going to feel particularly guilty if I, if I don't. Uh, that's a disagreeable person. Um, as well as uh, they wouldn't be polite. They'd be much more blunt. They'd say things that are not um, um, particularly nice at times. Uh, they're, they'll speak up and, and, and stand up for themselves. They'll disagree with you. They're willing to cause tension. Uh, they're competitive. Uh, those are the kind of the opposites of uh, those traits. But again, people that answered compassion-oriented uh, questions one way tended to also uh, answer uh, politeness questions in one way. So of course, those were uh, um, uh, recognized and lumped under the factor of agreeableness together. All right, last one, neuroticism. This one is uh, can kind of be broken down into withdrawal and um, volatility. So what I mean by that? Withdrawal means they actually socially withdraw because they uh, are experiencing depression, perhaps, uh, anxiety, you know, intense fear, stress, uh, other mood disorders. And obviously if one is in any of those states, um, well, I can't just say mood disorders because somebody who's manic is going to actually be very involved. I should take that one off. Uh, but yeah, depression, anxiety, uh, so people that deal with stress, that's going to cause them to uh, uh, be emotionally withdrawn uh, or at least socially withdrawn. So they're not going to obviously engage. Uh, they're not going to be very active. Uh, they'll be uh, defined, not defined by, but suffer from, you know, bouts of lethargy, hopelessness, things like that, or avoid social situations because their anxiety is so high. Um, and they have lower life expectancies because they're constantly experiencing uh, that uh, general adaptation syndrome, so it's wearing away uh, at their um, uh, resources, and that's going to affect their immune system and bodily repair and all of that. Um, and the volatility is your emotional stability. So uh, your propensity to uh, get um, uh, quickly get angry, uh, lose your temper, uh, be irritable, etc. Irritable. Um, uh, your uh, how quickly you get uh, stressed out by a situation that can also be withdrawal, but this more so deals with uh, you can't control your temper uh, or emotions as well as you would like to if you're scoring high uh, in those. The opposites, of course, somebody who's uh, low in neuroticism would be an emotionally stable person, somebody who is very resistant to stress, anxiety, depression, they hardly ever experience it or requires a major stressor. This is just like Ising's findings. Uh, and uh, regarding volatility, they have a good hold on their emotions. They don't succumb to their anger or irritability very often, uh, or at least less likely than others. And so since people uh, who answered one way in the withdrawal category uh, answered similarly in the volatility category, so they lumped those together because they have a high correlation, and they, uh, of course, formed the factor of neuroticism. So how do you know what you are? You would take a test. Um, I think McRae's test... Originally, they had like 240 questions. There's a whole bunch. Uh, and they'll find questions that have to deal with these um, factors and all these little subcategories in those factors. And uh, you'll take the test, and it'll uh, log your response. And, and because you know, it's a survey, it'll, it'll weigh it against the, the, the data of others. And it'll give you a score uh, of 0 to 100. And that does not mean percentage. Like, if I get a 0, that means I got an F. Or I got 100, means I got 100%. That's not what it means. Um, it gives you a percentile ranking, which we've talked about before. Uh, zero to 100 uh, percentile ranking. And uh, the actual number is not a reflection of being good or bad. Again, a high or low number does not indicate good or bad, uh, positive or negative. And I don't mean emotion, like this is a positive emotion uh, 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 factor, this is a negative emotion factor, or sensitivity to positive negative emotions. I mean like, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're if you score 100 in openness and zero in conscientiousness, doesn't mean you got an A and an F, doesn't mean you're good at batting like that. It just means, oh, these are the things that uh, uh, characterize you, that you like and you enjoy. And if you got a zero here, these would be the things that you don't like or don't enjoy or don't characterize you. All right. And they determine that by comparing you to other people. 
So they look at all of the answers of all the people that have uh, taken the questionnaires, um, or you know, taken the individual questionnaires and, and formed that, that, that survey data, um, and they, they compare you. So they say, okay, let, let's say I took a personality test and it gave me something like this. I'm just gonna do random 100, uh, 80, just down by 20 each time, 40 and 20. That would mean that out of 100 people, I had the highest openness score uh, out of all 100. All right, so 99 people uh, took this on average, and uh, those 99 answered lower or, or had less interest um, to uh, openness to experience uh, topics like uh, th those on intellect uh, or those on art, beauty, etc. And again, I need to remind you, intellect doesn't mean that I'm smart. That just means I like abstract ideas. I could be very interested in abstract ideas and have a low IQ or a high IQ and just not be interested in abstract ideas. Uh, if I got an 80 in conscientiousness, that means out of 100 people on average, I'm higher in uh, conscientiousness than uh, 80 of them. So that would mean that 20-ish um, people uh, are more industrious or orderly than I am. Uh, and again, that can vary. Like I could actually get like a 90 here and a 70 here, and that of course gives me an 80, something like that. But um, uh, that means that again, uh, in these categories, uh, I'm, I'm more, or I value these things more than uh, uh, 80 people. And it goes on down uh, the same way. Uh, so in this case, it'd be, oh, my enthusiasm, assertiveness, my, my sensitivity, positive emotion, my outgoingness, uh, my activity, my action taking. Um, out of 100 people, uh, I score higher than 60 of them. Uh, and agreeableness, as far as how compassionate or polite I am, uh, I'm only more compassionate or polite than 40 people. Uh, and then neuroticism, uh, uh, I am, <clears throat> if I got a 20, that means out of 100 people, I scored uh, higher than only 20 of them, 80 other people scored higher than me, which would mean, in this case, uh, I'm not very prone to uh, withdrawal, and I'm not very volatile compared to other people. All right, and these, these scores, are, of course, can vary. I just gave those as random examples. It could be something like this. Oh, uh, 82 and 77 and uh, 96 and... Uh, four and uh, zero. It could be something like that, and that would just mean your placement on average among 40 people. So that is how it works. Again, these are um, uh, very, very uh, psychometrically sound. Um, the contributors to these tests, McRae and Costa in particular, are renowned psychologists. They're highly cited. Uh, this stuff is uh, firmly established as uh, psychological, uh, it's I mean, you can't quite say it's a fact, but it is incredibly close to being uh, dead on. Um, so just as a, a um, what to take away from this, if I go and take one of these tests, um, and by the way, if you do decide to take a personality test, answer it how you feel you are honestly. Don't answer these things as the person you would want to be. So if you, uh, if you want to be super productive, but you're not, and you have a question about it, don't answer it like, yeah, I want to be this. You would answer like, oh, well, actually, uh, I'm not very good at doing my, my, my chores or my homework. So you might, you know, on a one to five, five being I do it really quickly all the time, or and number one, I hardly ever do, you might actually have to click a two, and, but you want to click a four or a five because that's what you would want to be. So you answer honestly about how you are. You take it, it gives you results. What do you do with the results? Uh, these results, um, from this test, results can, for you individually, can, uh, number one, inform you, you of uh, your uh, interests. So it, I'm not going to be successful, i talk about intrinsic motivation here, if I go down, if I pursue a job or a field or a, a relationship with somebody or some topic, if I'm talking about career, that uh, I don't naturally enjoy. So if I'm somebody who scored really high in openness, that means I like new experiences, abstract things, uh, and I decide to become an accountant, I have probably chosen the wrong career because I'm gonna be bored pretty quick. Uh, accountants deal with a very consistent set of, uh, I don't wanna say overly simple because you know there's complexities to tax laws and things like that, uh, but it's not particularly abstract uh, and it's not particularly dynamic. It's gonna be a very uh, set, um, a set of behaviors and, uh, and, and practices. Uh, you're probably gonna deal with the same office and, and, and uh, surroundings, and so that's not gonna be a good, probably not a good idea if you're, if you're high in openness. If you're high in conscientiousness, uh, that means you're really productive and you like routines and things like that, 
Um, probably uh, if you decide, oh, I want to be a um, manager at a, at a corporation or, or a business, rather, um, that might be a good idea. Because if you're a manager, you definitely have to be uh, productive, uh, self-motivating, uh, and you have to be able to be organized and keep track of the people. But if you're low in conscientiousness, management not, might not be the call for you. You might want to go with a job that's more um, uh, fluid, dynamic, and less dependent on uh, consistency. So that's how you could inform it as far as your interests. And, and lastly, uh, and it can inform you of your view of your, for, first of all, your strengths, uh, but also your weaknesses. So um, if I'm scoring high in eroticism, uh, that is not something that I would uh, want to, uh, that could be a weakness in many scenarios. So if I'm high in neuroticism, uh, I'm aware of that. So now I should not put myself in situations or jobs long term, I'm not talking about short term. Uh, I'm probably not going to pick a job, let's say I do score high in neuroticism, I'm probably not going to want to pick a job that's really stressful, uh, one that's constantly changing and dynamic. So, uh, if I'm a very neurotic person, uh, a good profession for me to choose would uh, probably not be something that's always changing or it's highly risky. Like I wouldn't want to be a, a stockbroker uh, if I was uh, high in eroticism. Why? Because uh, it's a very risky job. You don't know exactly what's going to happen. You're trying to make guesses on what will happen, but if it doesn't work out, you lose a bunch of money. It'd be a terrible job for you. You'd be way overstressed and you'd be bad at it. Uh, but picking a job that's stable might be a good one. Um, what's a stable job that's, that's consistent? Um, if you wanted to, just off the top of my head, um, this isn't like a pinnacle job or anything, but uh, a job that would be consistent would be perhaps uh, uh, a worker at a, uh, oh, at the Tesla factory that I, I have right here down the highway. Uh, that's pretty consistent. Uh, if you're a, an assembly line worker, a warehouse worker, you're, you're gonna have some, obviously, dynamics that you have to, to problem solve for uh, and deal with, but for the most part, you go to the same factory and you're doing routine, relatively the same job uh, over and over, uh, and um, maybe Tesla's not the most stable factor to work out as far as your job goes, but you'd want to pick a company that you know uh, is consistent, it's got a long history, uh, and it's a job that doesn't require a whole lot of stress um, uh, or, or, or dynamic situations um, that would make you perhaps, uh, that would spark your um, uh, anxiety or, or whatever uh, neurotic trait uh, you might uh, possess. So. Uh, that's what you can do. Uh, you can use it to inform your long-term decision-making, to find jobs you would generally be satisfied or interested in or good at, but also to avoid jobs or situations where uh, you're not likely to succeed. Um, let's say, for example, um, just one more example, I'm high in extroversion, like enthusiasm, for example, uh, or assertiveness, whatever, whichever one. People who are high in extroversion tend to be, not always, tend to be a lot more impulsive. Um, so, I probably don't want to put myself in a situation where uh, I'm likely to just uh, ignore my responsibilities and go do something fun, right? So if I'm, a, if I'm like, oh, I've got to do this uh, research project or whatever, or study this test, and I'm an extrovert, and I know that, I'm really prone to uh, impulsivity, I should probably isolate myself. Uh, I probably should not, you know, if I, if I need to study for two hours, I should actually isolate myself for that two hours, like turn my phone off, put it away. Um, um, not use my computer or programs or browsers that I might, uh, you know, go on to my desktop and play video games on or uh, go to social media or whatever it is or YouTube, um, which is what you're watching this on. Um, I probably don't want to surround myself with people because that's going to distract me. I'm just going to be bored with this and be like, oh, hey, and then go talk to that person. So set yourself up for success uh, by knowing your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, give yourself uh, a plan and environment, etc. cetera, uh, goals that align with that. There we go. That's personality. Thank you.